Hey there, everyone. This is Tom from Wall Street Value. Thank you for tuning in today. And we have a real special guest. I'm real honored to have the privilege to interview Guy Spear. Just to give you some information, some background information on Guy, he's the founder and the portfolio manager for the Aquamarine Fund, which is a fund that focuses on the value investing strategy. He's also the author of The Education of a Value Investor. And a few years back, he had the opportunity to have lunch with none other than the great Warren Buffett. So I'm going to introduce to you, Guy Spear. Hey, Guy. Hey, Tom. Hey, Guy. How are you? Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yeah. Great to meet you. Yeah, you as well. Well, thank you very much for taking the time to, uh, to be on the call with me today. I really appreciate it. Yeah, I'm. Um, uh, uh, I, I'm going to put a video on a second. I'm. I'm sort of. Well, I'll. So what happened to me last night is that I, I was home alone and I did my own cooking and I happen to like garlic and I don't like that my wife never puts garlic into food. So I went overboard and put a whole, uh, like not just a clove, but a whole onion full of garlic into the sauce that I cooked. It tasted delicious at the time that I ate it, but it gave me some kind of garlic poisoning. Body has not been feeling very well. And so I'm, I, I just got into the office like an hour ago and um, I'm 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 trying to remember what the call is about. <laughs> <laughs> no, that, that's perfectly fine. Yeah. So I run a company called Wall Street Value. We're an investor education company that teaches students who are new at investing. Um, we have some students that maybe have hired financial advisors in the past, but might not have the best experience and are looking to learn how to do this on their own. And we focus our strategy of investing around value investing. And so that's one of the reasons why I wanted to pick your brain because you are, you know, rock star, obviously in the value investing community. You think I'm a rock star? I'm not really, but uh, and um, and sorry, forgive me for the. Um, we're not even connected on LinkedIn, dude. We're not. I know we are on Facebook and Instagram. Yeah, uh, but not on. The, I just sent you a LinkedIn request. Okay, so oh. now at least I've seen your LinkedIn profile, and um, so. Forgive me for uh, so so. We, how are we doing this? this? Is just a kind of an offline interview. This is a recorded interview. How would do you, you want to do it? Well, I was going to ask you. Would you would you be okay if I do record this? Absolutely, no problem. In fact, okay, I, uh, um, I'm curious. Uh, you know, I know that Zoom can be used to record um, to record podcasts. Uh, uh, and, I don't. I don't do any podcasting. What I was hoping to do with this, with your permission, is, um, you know, ask you some questions here that are common questions our students ask. Yeah. Uh, you know, I teach um, an eight-week class on investing. I teach some, on, some online courses and then some one-on-one -on -one investing. Yeah. But you know, obviously they would like to hear from people who you know, run their own funds like you do, the Aquamarine yeah. Fund. You've had uh, lunch with Warren Buffett, which I'm sure that was yeah. pretty awesome. And yeah, so just was. here, what's that? It was. Yeah. So, so, so you, you just want to, if you want to record the video and use the video in your classes, something like that? Yeah, just to give um, some, some of your advice to my students, if you will. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So uh, no, you, you blast away. Uh, do you know how to record? I do, yeah, I'm recording it right now. Um, just yeah. Before oh, I um, exactly. do anything with this, I'm gonna send it over to you. That's better. Oh, there we go. Yeah, I, I wanna look a little bit nicer. There we go. <laughs> yeah, it looks wonderful, man. I know right. it makes a difference where you look into the camera. By the way, uh, what you see in the background is you see my desk and you also see a photograph of Warren Buffett there. I see that there, that's pretty cool. And so, so if you're recording it, what's the sound like? Are we okay with the sound? Yeah, you sound great. Can you okay, hear me I'm okay? Gonna, I'm gonna shut the window, it may improve it a little bit. Sure. Here we go. All right. I'm gonna send you the recording. Um, I'm, I'll edit it out uh, and, and I'll send you the recording. And if you're yeah, okay with it. Anything, whatever you decide, whatever, what, what you, you can send it to me as a courtesy, it's very kind of you, but but no, um, don't worry. I, you know, everything I say will be fine. I won't be like sort of, you have to cut this out or cut that out or something like that. Oh, I appreciate that. Uh, by the way, Chantal seems like a real sweetheart. She's nice amazing. Couple. She's yeah. just extraordinary. And I'm trying to work out where Sewell, New Jersey is. Uh, so do you, have you been to Philadelphia? Uh, you know, uh, I've driven from New York to Philadelphia at least 10 times in my life, I believe. Okay. 
So we're about 15 minutes, maybe less than 15 minutes from Philadelphia. Okay. From South Philly, where the stadiums are. And we're about 40 to 45 minutes from Atlantic City. Yeah, it's so weird. So you are south of Philadelphia. Correct. In New Jersey. Yes. So I mean, so obviously I've been to Cherry Hill. Oh, really? Okay. I have an office there. And I, I, I live about 15 minutes south of Cherry Hill. 15, 20 minutes. I, I don't think... I don't think I've ever been that far south of Philadelphia, believe it or not. It's kind of like, you know, it's such a, it's a, well, it's an interesting, and you're in New Jersey, obviously, yeah, because, because uh, Pennsylvania starts at the Delaware River, is that right? Yes, correct. You know, oh, I'm just, yeah. I'm looking at a Google map and I'm just seeing, you know, uh, I, I'm just seeing that the Delaware River is actually quite an important river. I'm realizing. Yeah. And, and actually, sorry, while we're at it, is Harrisburg an important? Uh, what's the river that goes up through Harrisburg? Schuylkill River, maybe? I should probably know this. Uh, Harrisburg is the capital of Pennsylvania. And what's neat about Harrisburg, uh, since you have three kids, right next to it is Hershey Park. Right. Susquehanna. They call it the Susquehanna, the Susquehanna River. Oh, that's right. The Susquehanna River. Yeah. OK. So interesting. And then but yeah. the river that goes up. So, you know, we have the Hudson River that is, mm -hmm. but actually, I didn't realize, I mean, I should have realized the, the river that goes up via Philadelphia is, what's the name of that river? There's the Delaware and the Schuylkill River. The Delaware River. Okay. And then, of course, New Jersey is everything that's south of the Delaware River, basically. Yes. So interesting. Anyway, yeah, I mean, so just briefly, for, it's sort of, it's not one thing that I really like about the Philadelphia area is that the people who settled Philadelphia were more Dutch and less English. Mm -hmm. And I, I see that very much in the architecture. I, you know, I kind of, the way the British build kind of annoys me. Mm -hmm. The way the Dutch build, I kind of like it. The British, they were always building with kind of these wood frame <laughs> houses. And you always walk into a New England style home and the whole thing kind of like some people love it. You hear all the wood and, you know, it sort of creaks. And if the wind blows, the whole frame of the house moves. Right. It was my experience of houses in the Philadelphia area, especially if you go out west into Lancaster County, is that they're far more. Um, I love it out there. It's beautiful. Yeah. But, but there's, there's just a whole different architecture there, which I just love. So, mm -hmm. um, Have you ever been out to the Lancaster? Where the um, um, have you been to Lancaster, Pennsylvania? I haven't been to Lancaster, but I've been. Uh, and and I'm, as I'm talking, I'm looking on the map to try and remember. There's a kind of uh, I I feel like it's west, but I need to double check. Uh, uh, I don't remember the name of the area, but I was visiting somebody in a suburb of Philadelphia, and it, I went on a big highway that I feel like was west. Um, and I can't see the name of the place or the highway, but maybe I'm looking at the wrong, uh, the wrong magnification. Um, but anyway, yeah. 476 or the Schuylkill Expressway. Those are the two major uh, expressways going west from Philadelphia. Yeah, um, what is the name? It's a kind of like, I guess it's a suburb that people live in and I just can't, I can't see it. But it's so interesting as I'm looking here, I'm seeing like Bryn Mawr. I used to have friends from Bryn Mawr College and I saw that, uh, is it Swarthmore? That is Swarthmore, down, yeah. Is down there. And so there's all these places that are familiar to anybody who's lived in it. I actually did a course once in Conshohocken. Oh, really? Okay. <laughs> I went to school not too far from there. My wife and I graduated from, uh, it was Eastern College at the time. It's now Eastern University which is just a stone's throw away from uh, Villanova and Bryn Mawr. Oh, right. Villanova, I've heard of that. Uh, it's a yeah, school. I, I'm reasonably sure that it was on, out on the 276, basically. The 276, okay, yeah. Yeah. It was like the PA anyway, one. yeah, there you go. That kind of used to be home for me, you know? Oh, really? I didn't know that. Not well, the Northeast, the okay. US Northeast. I used to live, I used to live in New York City. So I knew you lived there, yeah. And that, no, I never lived in Philadelphia, but uh, 
but you know, I'm just saying the whole northeast. Uh, it's all kind of like one area, basically. How do you like it over here? Oh, you know, the U.S. is an amazing part. It's an amazing country. It's, mm -hmm. it's a special place. You know, I, I invest there a lot. Uh, you know, it's uh, the U.S. is the U.S. I feel like uh, it was really good for me. I mean, I spent almost 20 years of my life there. All three of my children were born in the United States. Okay. Uh, I feel like uh, I will always be quote a citizen of New York City, something mm -hmm. like that. And um, uh, you know, and I just at at this point in my life, I needed to get well. Ten years ago, I needed to get back to Europe. I wanted to be. I wanted my children to grow up in Europe. Mm -hmm. And uh, but I, you know, it's possible that some other point in my life, I might end up living in the U.S. again. How often do you travel over here? Oh, I, I'm in the U.S. like three or four times a year, I'd say. For one oh, okay. Reason. Yeah, I'm, I'm there all the time. Mm -hmm. But, uh, but, you know, Europe, Europe's also a fantastic part of the world, you know. And I, I feel lucky. I feel like I don't have to choose. And, you know, um, if, you, if you look at flying times, so if you want to fly from Singapore to uh, Sydney, or, you know, distances in the Far East, you want to go from S S Singapore to Sydney, that's like a, it's like a 12 hour flight. Okay. You know, it's like, it's like flying from, from, uh, from London to Los Angeles. Yeah. And so, you know, I feel like our part of the world, our part meaning uh, the United States and Western Europe, it's like we cover so much ground, mm -hmm. you know. And I had dinner with a family where the dad lives in Switzerland and the son lives in Brazil. Okay. Like, I mean, I know it's not, I mean, they're back and forth the whole time. They kind of, you know, it's very easy to do that. Yeah. So. I would love to get over to Europe. Switzerland's definitely on my bucket list. It looks absolutely beautiful there. Yeah, what, what I would tell you is um, don't, uh, you know, the, what some people will say is like, oh, it's such a big place, or it's such a wonderful place. It's definitely not worth going if you don't go for at least three weeks. Oh, really? Okay. And, no, and my answer to you is, if you have a day, go for a fucking day. <laughs> you know? And like, don't treat it as somewhere that's so far away. You'd, go, you'd fly out to LA for a meeting. Mm -hmm. you'd, fly to, you'd fly out to LA to take your children to uh, whatever it is, one of the parks, Disney parks. Oh, yeah. good enough event, you'd go there. So I'd say the same with Europe, you know, don't treat it as like someday I'll go there. Just, you know. Go for a weekend. Yeah. <laughs> Pick a city you go, you know. Mm -hmm. Book yourself into a concert or a theater or something and just fucking go. Yeah. And then come back, you know. It's not that big a deal. <laughs> Good flights. point. There are direct flights from Philadelphia to, I don't know, a lot of places in Europe. You get direct flights to Frankfurt, direct flights to London. Yeah, we got a pretty good airport here in Philly. Yes. Yeah, you can't get a direct flight to Zurich. You can get a direct flight to a lot of places. Okay. So, yeah. So. All right. Well, let's, get, we let's get started. So, uh, as I mentioned, most of my students are, are, are newer investing. Um, so, we're teaching them. Obviously, there's many different styles. You know, you, there, there, some pe people, they, they get into day trading. They see all these, you know, ads on Facebook and and everywhere and they think that's like the way to go and i try to steer people away from that because i've tried it when i first got started and had zero luck and i'm just staring at the computer screen all day trying to make a couple bucks and so i started studying warren buffett and then you know a good friend of yours phil town i i was a student of his i i, I was a coach with him uh, for some of his uh weekend seminars as a matter of fact phil's an excellent guy and i just adopted the value investing strategy it just made sense and so that's what I love teaching people now. So when did you get started investing and when did you decide to adopt the value investing and, and why did you decide to adopt yeah. the value investing strategy? I mean, for me, it, it stopped that I was interested in investing and then decided to quote adopt value investing. I was working as an investment banker and I was fascinated by the financial markets and the opportunities that the financial markets offered. And, um, and I went to work for an investment bank and then uh, I hated what I was doing at the investment bank because I, I felt like I was being paid to lie for a living. Mm -hmm. uh, it was just a question of telling different stories to different people and convincing 
uh, people for whom an investment was not really suited, that they ought to go and do it because if I wrote the ticket, then I'd get, I'd get the fee, so to speak, or I'd generate a fee. And uh, at that time, I, I was like, I mean, I wasn't ready to quit financial markets, but I was, I was very disaffected and very unhappy with what I was doing. And then I picked up the intelligent investor and I was like, and I, I started reading about Warren Buffett and all the things that I hated about my life, uh, he didn't have in his life. So he wasn't taking horrible fees off clients. He wasn't having to tell one thing to one person, a different thing to another person. He was telling the same story to everyone. And, uh, you know, it's, it's interesting because it's not like, it's not like I had to go away and make a decision. What, what, like this, this, this emotion in me rose that when I fucking, excuse my language, you might want to take that out. I hate my life. I like his life. How do I change what I'm doing to be more like what he's doing? Because I like what he's doing and I hate what I'm doing. And that just sort of, um, consumed me in a certain way. And I think that when you get those moments in your life, you really have to sort of like go with them. You can't resist that. You have to sort of just, there's enormous energy and potential in those kinds of things. But I guess that's a long way of saying that it wasn't, it wasn't kind of a rational, it wasn't a sort of like, oh, this isn't working. Let me try this as a quote strategy. Uh -huh. So uh, I think that it's probably the same way when, when Sir Edmund Hillary, the guy who first climbed Everest, you know, he didn't say, you know, I think I'm going to try as a strategy for success in life to climb that mountain. He was, he, you know, there was some part of him that said, I have to get to the top of that mountain. Right. I have to be there. That sense of, this has to happen. Or I have to do everything in my power to make this happen. Because if it doesn't happen, if I don't do everything in my power, I will live my life with regrets. Uh -huh. Something like that. So, uh, and you know, I just want to pick up on something that I was never, ever tempted by like, well, first of all, casinos, yeah. I'll tell you, this is a true story, Tom, you will not believe it, but I'm telling you, it's a true story. The first time I went into a casino was with my dad. It was in the French city of Cannes, which is on the French Riviera. Mm -hmm. And he wanted to show me a roulette table. And he took at the time a uh, hundred French francs, which is like, uh, I don't know, five pounds or um, $10, something like that. And uh, he, um, he said, look, this is a roulette table. I remember the number. He said, look, I put this on the number 18. And I remember it was number 18. I swear to God, the roulette table came around and it came down, the, the ball came down on number 18. And cool. we, whatever it was, 36 times our money. 3,600 francs. And I was so frustrated because all I wanted to do was take the money and buy dinner. Mm -hmm. And my father insisted on gambling all the money away and we had fun at blackjack tables and whatever. But, but I was never taken by, the, you know, the, the desire to gamble, the desire to, 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 to um, place your bet on something and put yourself at risk and then to have that shot of endorphin, that dopamine high when you win is never something that attracted me. I was never, it never, it never grabbed me. And I think that what's really important for anybody who's listening to this is to recognize if you are the type who gets a dopamine high from that sort of gambling tendency, and there are many places that exploit that gambling tendency. So obviously uh, casinos do it. Uh, people like me, I just go into casino. I have no interest. I walk out. I know the odds are not in my favor. I'm like, this is no fun. Why would I do this? I do not understand how anybody could think of it as a game. It's a game where the odds are stacked against me. You know? They're in business for a reason. <laughs> Pardon? So the casinos are, are, are still in business for a reason. Yeah. And then, you know, the thing is, is that the, the financial markets throw up many, many more ways, many more things that are casino-like than things that are investing-like. And if it's casino-like, it's not investing. You know, and like Warren uh, Buffett says, he had a quote. Um, uh, I hope I'm saying it correctly. Uh, his investment strategy is a boring, lazy, and bordering on sloth. It's boring on sloth, and and you just have to recognize the probabilities on the bets. I mean, yes, if you go and keep 
Rolly, I mean, you know, the best one is, uh, is blackjack. If you keep playing blackjack, then if you play it in the right way and you, you count cards in the right way and you bet in the right amounts, you can kind of, you can potentially even have the odds be in your favor, but they're only very slightly in your favor. What fun is that? <laughs> yeah. You don't want to play with, you know, money. you want to evaluate, you know, what's the game that is being played here and, you know, know that in any circumstance, you don't have to play the game if you don't want to and only go and play when the odds are stacked in your favor. And that's never going to be at a casino. Never, yeah. ever. Right. So, so, you know, and, and similarly, I mean, I would just tell you, uh, we can get into it more if you like. There are so many people talking about cryptocurrencies. And I look at it and I, and I you know, so, so you know, first of all, unlike holding cash, if I make money in the cryptocurrency, I have to pay tax on mm -hmm. the profit, you know? Second of all, I, I, have, I have some financial institution because I can't own the cryptocurrency. Well, I guess I could own it so-called in a wallet or something like that, but most people do it through an exchange of some kind or other. So the exchange is now your brokerage fund. You know, do I trust the, do I trust the exchange? Do I trust the brokerage fund? I mean, brokerage firms don't go out of business generally because they're well regulated, but exchanges go out, go out of business all the time. There are already a few indications that would suggest that the odds are stacked against me in cryptocurrencies. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, so yeah. Uh, I, I agree with that 100%. Um, I, I don't understand it enough to invest in it. Um, I don't know how to value it like you would, you know, a, a Disney or, you know, some blue chip company. So if I don't understand it, I, I don't know what makes it go up or down or how to value it. it, it to me, that's gambling. Um, so w what are some of the things that you do look for in investment? I, I know you're, you're a big fan of, of the checklist. And that, to me, that's one of the things that we, we teach also. And I think that's one of the ways that we're able to maybe put some more of those odds in our favor. I mean, you know, and, and I think that if you go to the other extreme, uh, when, when are the odds stacked in your favor? And so, you know, the, the way if, you, if you know, I could actually, it's funny, we're online. So you know, we could pull up the Forbes list of wealthiest people on the planet or in the United States. And, you know, I didn't, I, didn't, yeah, I didn't look at it recently, but I didn't see anybody who trades cryptocurrencies on there. <laughs> and I don't really see people who are day traders. Right. Uh, you see people like the Walton family who owned a business for a long time. You see Warren Buffett who owned a business for a very long time. So, uh, you know, the way to build and hold on to wealth long term is to buy into, as you know well, is, so what does it mean to buy into a great business? It's businesses that they're able to make money while serving society. You know, mm -hmm. a great business that I don't own shares of, and it's probably terrible that I don't and I ought to, is Costco. You know? yeah. Costco gets people the stuff they want. It serves them in that way. I haven't yet met somebody who doesn't love Costco. You know, and, uh, and, and so it serves them and they're able to make money at the same time. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, you know, that's all we're looking for, really. You know? And and that's it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's it. Do you ever see that uh, the BBC interview with Charlie Munger a couple of years ago? Uh, the person interviewing him asked him, you know, explain your investment strategy and and why do more people not adopt it? And and Charlie Munger said it, it it's so easy that the reason they don't teach it in the universities is the professor could teach the entire thing in one lecture and won't have anything else to talk about uh, the rest of the the semester. And yeah, uh, but, but, but here's what you can teach, uh, because, you know, what is what would be the example? You know, it, it, climbing a mountain's easy. You just go to the top, don't you? But exactly how you go to the top, which path you take. Do you take the glacier and you climb the ice? Do you take the path and risk the avalanches? You know, do you climb in summer or in winter? You know, all of those things. So to say I want to get to the top of Everest is easy to say, to buy it, but then... How do you get there? So where do you spend your time? Uh, and so where do I spend my time? I spend my time trying to prove the probability that when I end up pulling the trigger, when I end up buying something, that it will be a great company at a cheap price. Okay. And so, you know, to, to just forgive me, because you happen to bring up, we, I, I brought up or somebody brought up casino. So, I'll, you know, Charlie Munger says, just tell me where I'm going to die so that I never go there. <laughs> well, 
you know, I never ever want to step into a casino. A casino is just not a good place to be because you're surrounded by horrible bets. Just about anything you do, the best bet you can probably do is go to the bar and buy a drink. You know, that's probably the best bet you've got in the casino. So you just never ever want to shop in the casino. Funnily enough, I had to, I attended a meeting where, which took place in Las Vegas. And so I don't remember where, which hotel we stayed in. But I discovered that there's one hotel there that doesn't have a casino inside. And I told the group that I was meeting with that I will be happy to go back to Las Vegas and do a meeting there, but I will be staying in the Four Seasons Hotel. Mm -hmm. And I will prefer for all of our meetings to take place in the one building or one of the very few buildings on the strip that doesn't have a casino inside. And then the question is, where do you want to show up? Well, you want to show up in all the places where you're having conversations about and learning more about businesses that create wealth and value. So, you know, I happen to bring up Costco. Yeah. You know, the, there's, the, the, the simple thing to do there is to show up to a Costco annual meeting or show up to an analyst meeting, meet the investors who are there, give out business cards, listen to the conference calls, uh, download a transcript of the conference call, find out who's asking questions on the conference calls, look at the list of shareholders, uh, maybe write to the shareholders. So why? Because anything that expands the uh, space that is taken up by thinking about better businesses is going to drive out worse businesses. And then eventually when I have cash uh, to use in an investment, then I'm more likely to buy a better investment, if that makes sense. Absolutely. So, all, you know, and, and we think, you know, it's easy. You can say in one, in, you can say in one sentence, oh, the goal is to climb Everest. That's like Charlie's Munger statement, the goal is to buy better businesses. But now you put yourself into the shoes of uh, Sir Edmund Hillary, and he's like, he's going to climbing shops, he's studying climbing gear, he's studying routes up there, he's trying to find Sherpas, he's trying, you know, he's learning so much, so much, and working so hard on everything around it, everything. You know, even, it's interesting, so um, as you can see, I like the climbing analogy. Uh, Alex Honnold, who, who climbed El Capitan. He's a kind of a, he, 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 he's the subject of a movie called Free Solo. Okay. And uh, it's, I mean, what, the feat that he did is just extraordinary. He's a, he's a total nutter. I mean, he climbed up like 3,000 3, foot rock face in like six hours one day without a rope wow. to, to hold him. But he went and studied the route beforehand. Mm -hmm. The whole route had been studied. He'd gone and cleaned moss off the route. I mean, he was smart in the way he went through it. Yeah, it so, uh, so easy to say, but but the simple setting the goal means that you have endless amounts of work, endless endless amounts of work. So, okay. Now, when when you find a company like Costco, yeah, um, what types of ways do you use to to figure out? what is a fair price to buy that stock? Yeah, that's a great question. And uh, I think that, that what, what, what every one of us has to do, Tom, is to, um, we have to be willing to go to that quiet, uh, lonely, uncomfortable place where we are just with ourselves. So the place at which you take the decision has to be where there is no stock monitor in front of you. You're not reading Seeking Alpha. You're not exchanging messages with whoever the hell you'd like to exchange messages with. You do all of that. And, it, you know, and, and, and ideally you sequence how you do that. But at the end of the day, you go, you go for a walk. I go to my library, uh, in the shower, place where you know and it's just like is this something that i want to do with my money or is this something that i want to do with my investors money and realize that most of the time it's going to be no yeah, you right. know yeah. and i think that i i actually there's been more than once so you know you know that feeling that you're going to jump off a of a of a um jump into the ocean from a kind of a rock like say a rock it's like 20 feet up or 10 feet up and you sort of jump and you go here goes nothing mm -hmm. you know? and then you know you jump into the air and then you land in the water and there's that feeling of heart in, the, in one's throat for a short second and then you then you land in the water and it's all fine so 
that is not the feeling that one should have when one invests. So the idea of- You want to have absolute confidence. Pardon? You want to have absolute confidence in what you're putting your money in. Yeah, I mean, you know, there's a British expression, it's called being a plunger. You know, it's like, it's like take, a, take, a, take a great big flying bet on something. I think that the, the kind of analogy is more like you're jumping from one side of a, um, you know, you're jumping from two rocks and there may be a chasm in between, but you're jumping and you know exactly where you're gonna land and you know that the distance that you're jumping is a distance that you know how to jump. And yeah, it's kind of scary to look down and you know that if the world goes terribly wrong, you could fall through and that would be really unpleasant. But you're kind of very, very confident that you can jump from rock A to rock B without falling in between the crack. Mm -hmm. And I think every time that I've kind of invested with that feeling of, well, here goes nothing. I'm feeling like I'm a bit of an idiot because all these smart people are doing it and I really want to join them. That's kind of the feeling of jumping off the, off the rock into the open ocean. And I, like when you, when, I, when you jump into the open ocean, you know, you see that there's water down there. It's that feeling of jumping into something that you don't know exactly what will show up. Except that, you know, in the open ocean, you have a freaking sea below you. So it's fine. But that's not, it's a constrained jump. It's like, I know where I'm landing. I know where my foot will go. I know exactly what will happen after I land. That's the feeling that you need to have. Okay. Uh, and, then, and when you do, I'm sorry, go ahead. Sorry, Tom. The reason why, um, <clears throat> the reason why I'm kind of going to this, it sort of, it might feel to you or uh, other people who hear this, uh, well, the reason why I'm going to fluffy stuff, it's like, you know, so somebody listening to this might say, no, no, I want him to give me hard analysis, you know? And the point is this, you know, do all the analysis you want to do. And, uh, and I'm not saying don't do analysis, and I'm not saying it's not smart to learn how to do analysis and to learn the right metrics and learn the ways in which people manipulate accounting. And to, but at the end of the day, at the end of the day, you can do all of that and you know you can improve your skills at that. But, but, but it, you're always going to get to the point where you have to put the analysis aside, you have to put the spreadsheet aside, you have to put the checklist aside and you have to say, all right, is this now something that I'm ready to do? Does this look more like the jump from one rock to another? Or does this feel like a, a jump into open air where I'm not really quite sure what's going to happen? Mm -hmm. And so at the end of the day, the decision is always an emotional decision or it's the decision is based in the emotions. And you have to kind of know yourself, why am I doing this? Am I doing this for the right reasons? if that makes sense to you. It does. And, and tell me what your thoughts are on this. So if I'm investing in a company, obviously you want to take as, as much risk out of it as possible. So we're investing in companies that we do know and, and, and that, we, that we fully understand. So what would you say to someone who is you know, ready to take that jump, but, but still might be a little nervous, you know, that they're, they're getting you know, paralysis by analysis. How would they be comfortable taking that next step? Yeah, that's a great question. And, and it's, the question is, am I being paralyzed by analysis? And therefore, you know, what is actually a well-defined jump into a well-defined landing space? Uh, you know, I'm perceiving it to be a jump into open air, into thin air, but it's not. You know, that's kind of like that process of knowing yourself, knowing where you are. I just think that's, that's something that takes years and years of learning you know this this idea of the inner journey who am i in this situation mm -hmm. am i a guy who's just desperate to gamble or am i a guy you know is it that version of me that's showing up to the situation or is it the version of me you know and and there's you know knowing which is which and is is or developing the experience to get a sense of which is which is something that i just think takes time i think that the good news with investing is that you don't have to do an all another nothing decision. Mm -hmm. you, know, you know, what was so tragic about the Kobe Bryant disaster yeah. is that he was making a bet with his life. So he was making the decision to fly or not to fly where um, if, if it didn't work out, he could die. 
you know, that was, that was not a good thing to do, obviously. Uh, when we're running a portfolio, we could say, all right, this is a probabilistic decision. I don't know. I don't know if I'm jumping into thin air, if I'm jumping to a well-defined landing space. Mm. And because I don't know, I'm going to do this with 5% of my assets, or I'll do it with 10%. So that if it turns out that I was mistaken, you know, Kobe Bryant did not get onto that helicopter thinking that there was a possibility of death. He obviously wouldn't have gotten onto the helicopter. Uh, but uh, he didn't have the option of saying, well, I'll just do this with 5% of my life. Yeah. That even if the helicopter crashes, I'll have 90% of, 95% of my life still in the bag. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so, uh, so I, what, what am I trying to say? I think that your question is a good one. I don't think that, that you know, how do I know that I know? How do I know that I don't know? Is something that is very hard to answer. I think we get clues through experience. And because it's hard to answer, uh, to be um, circumspect and to do it with only a certain percentage of one assets is totally fine. Yeah. You know, and that's and one of the things that we do teach also is you know, when you're building that portfolio, you, know, you're, you only want to put you know, two to 5% in any one particular yeah. holding. And one of the things I learned from Phil, uh, Phil Town, is that when you're buying a company that you fully understand, you, you do your analysis and you do your valuations and you're comfortable with it, then you shouldn't really worry too much getting into the position because let's say the stock is at $50 a share. You'll love it at 50. You did your analysis and you believe it's worth more than that. Well, if it goes down to $40 a share, you know, most people would freak out and get nervous by that. But a true value investor, someone who understands a great business and the valuations, well, if you liked it at 50, wouldn't you like it even more at $40 a share? Yeah. Well, it's, you know, and uh, it's easy to say that. Mm -hmm. But it's a lot harder to do. And I, you know, I've been doing this for more than 20 years. And I would say that uh, it's, it's hard to buy something when it's down 30% or 40%. It is really hard. And, and usually when it's down 30 or 40%, it's not down on no news. Uh, yeah, exactly. It's down on some development that's happened that is really kind of scary. And you mm -hmm. have to buy through that scaredness. You have to be aware that one way or another, whatever it is that is driving the price down will go away. Uh, but sometimes it's not so easy to know mm -hmm. that it will go away. And so, um, you know, so I have a fallback position to that, which is it's also okay to do nothing. Yeah. Buy it and do nothing. You know, uh, I'll tell you a fun story. One of the, one of those painful uh, war wounds that anybody who's, who's an investor has. So I had followed um, Lou Simpson, into a company called Laboratory Corporation of America. And at the time, they had taken on a bunch of debt to merge with uh, two, two laboratory corporations, two companies doing lab tests had merged. And I actually even visited the company in, um, in Greenville, North Carolina. Greenville, Burlington, North Carolina, not so far away from Greenville, I believe. Is that what and, um, They got into trouble on their debt covenants. Yeah. And the share price dropped. I happen to remember the share price. It was, I bought it $8 and the share price dropped to two. Mm -hmm. Now I should have known better, but what I should have done is load up on two. Instead I did the opposite, which is really stupid. I sold it around two because I just was feeling so terrible. Uh, and if I would, if the stock went to, I don't know, three, four, $500 more a share. So more than a hundred X, Mm -hmm. way more than 100x, like 200x. But even if I had not, if all I had done was just sit on my position and lived with my 75% loss, uh, I still would have had like a 15x. Yeah. You know, and so, so if you're in the right business, just, just to do nothing is fine. That's my default position, actually. Is it okay? What I would say is that, so, you know, um, you want to be doing it a long time. Because investing works when you do it for a long time. The most important thing that you need to do if you want to invest for a long time is you can't run out of willpower. You can't get exhausted. If you get exhausted, you're going to get kicked out of the game. Mm -hmm. so you don't want to get kicked out of the game. You can't do things that will allow you to lose the will to continue. And that might be because you run out of money. 
might be because you get tired, it might be because the stresses are too great, all of those things. And so, um, you know, to have, to have a rule that my default position is to do nothing takes a huge mental burden off me because I don't have to get to my computer and open up my stock monitor and see what's going on okay. for the wiggles of the market. And so to have that rule, not because you might, not because you, if you look at the market every day, you might catch things and you might save money or make money because you managed to trade something well, you managed to sell off when it's, but if you try and do that for 30 years, you're going to, you're going to burn yourself out. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't burn yourself out because then you're going to lose one of the most important benefits of investing, which is long-term compounding, basically. Yeah. So, so what are your uh, exit strategies? Uh, obviously, hold on to it for as long as possible if it's a great company. Um, yeah, I, that's the ideal. I mean, look, there's, there's investments that are working out in one way or another, and there are investments that aren't. Um, you know, when I say working out in one way or another, hopefully all of the investments I own are compounding at some rate or other. Some may be compounding at a high rate, some may be compounding at a low rate, but they're making money for me. The businesses are getting more valuable over time. And, um, and then probably I do nothing. Okay. Uh, because if it's working out in one way or another, I'm not gonna try and get cute on optimizing the portfolio. On the other side, there are all sorts of reasons why investments don't work out. And if it's not working out, what I've learned is, you know, it's a bit like a relationship. You know, we, we, we always, I don't know, you're probably married, but um, we've all been single and we've all been dating and we've all had the experience of breaking up with somebody, uh, you know, and after we've broken up, we say, wow, I need, I had to, I should have ended that three years ago or two years ago. I, I ended up way late. So we always end the relationship way later. And, you know, I guess all I'm saying is what uh, Warren has said, that the energy spent fixing a leaking boat is probably better spent getting into another boat. So when you when you waking up every day, when I'm waking up, up every day and I'm I'm seeing the problems with an investment that are not going away, maybe that's time to to you know get into another boat, basically. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good answer. <laughs> yeah. yeah so, so when you had lunch with Warren Buffett, you were also uh, uh, breaking bread with Moniz Pop, right, weren't you? Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah. What's uh, he like? He seems like a pretty cool guy as well. Uh, you know, it, it, it was it was hard. First of all, I've learned more from Monish Pabrai than I have from Warren Buffett. Mm -hmm. uh, I've spent more time with Monish Pabrai. Uh, and he has a very, very unusual and extraordinary mind. And it's kind of galling, Tom, to be around people who have unusual and extraordinary minds because it makes me realize how pedestrian my mind is. So the initial experience is that it's like, ouch, this is painful. I wanted to be the smartest guy in the room. <laughs> I know that I'm not the smartest guy in the room and that's hard. But um, yeah, I mean, I think that the, the process of uh, coming to terms with the fact that my mind is not Monish Pabrai's mind is actually a positive, it's, it's painful to the ego as it happens as, as, it, as one is living through it. But when you get to the other side of it, it's a positive because, you know, the key in so many things in life is to know what we're not good at and to know where other people are better. And I think one of the founders of IBM, Tom Watson said, you know, I'm, 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 he said to himself, he's not all that smart, but he's smart in spots and he knows where those spots are. And if you stick around those spots, you're going to do fine. Mm -hmm. That's just true for so many things in life, including investment. So, I think that as I've gotten to know Monish's mind better, I've gotten to understand the ways in which he's really extraordinarily brilliant. Yeah. And understand the ways in which I am not, in distinction, extraordinarily brilliant. I've I managed to stay away from those places and do better. And um, you know, there's this paradox in investing that you know, one thing that you know you don't want to do is uh is use the markets to prove how brilliant you are because they will always win you know <laughs> so one of the things one wants to do is to approach the markets with a sense of humility uh and and, and a, se a, a sense of um you know in a certain way almost terror 
at the awesome power of these markets to overwhelm even the strongest of institutions. Uh, the only, perhaps the only institution that the markets can't overwhelm are, are central banks. You know, and what is it? Uh, somebody said, don't ever get into a fight with somebody who buys ink by the barrel. They were talking about, they were talking about the, um, the press, the media, but you could also talk about the Fed. The Fed can print as much money as it likes. Mm -hmm. But even the Fed can come into circumstances like the financial crisis of 2008-9, where um, circumstances were very close to proving to be uh, too big or too difficult for the Fed to handle. We were very, very lucky that we had some really smart, thoughtful, knowledgeable people who took unprecedented action. Uh, but you know that that is that is an institution that almost failed the country that they can print unlimited money. They can print as much money as they like. Uh, for the rest of us, we need to approach uh, our investing lives with, with a sense of, you know, I'm walking, I'm walking along around mountains where an avalanche could come down and kill me any moment. And so I have to be super careful and super respectful of what's going on around me. Mm -hmm. Uh, there's no, actually, there's no, one of the nice things about meeting with and talking to investors is that any investor with any experience tends to be not to be egotistical because there's just no space for ego because your ego will get trashed in no time. You know, you're just yeah. going to get proven wrong so many times. Mm -hmm. I just want to see if there's some, yes, I'm in a happy place because there's water here. And I'm feeling, I'm still going through my, um, my uh, the processing of all the garlic. Okay, hope you feel better. Yeah, thank you. Well, if you don't mind, you guys just ask you just a couple more questions. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm speaking not, of, let's take a sip of water here. Okay, yeah, Moniz Pabre. Uh, one of the interesting things that he said um, a while back, I can't remember where I read it, but he said that you know he's as smart as he is. You know, he's, he's, he realized there's other investors out there that are even smarter than him. So a lot of his ideas. Mm -hmm part of his own ideas. He's not um, too proud to admit that most of his investment ideas come from piggybacking off of other investors. Yeah. So there are other guys that you um, kind of get ideas from and where do you find your investment ideas? Yeah. Besides just, you know, co companies that you're familiar with, companies that, that you know, yeah. like yeah. their model. So, uh, yeah, Monish is, uh, it was an act of great um, mastery of the ego to say, uh, I don't, you know, I, I clone the best from other people, you know, and he's got some quotes from the Tom Peters book where people tend not to do that in business. People have a real problem with things that were not invented here type of deal. And actually you should pick up, we should pick up the best ideas wherever we find them. And it's something that comes to us from the uh, academic world where your ideas have to be your own I and mean, you can't plagiarize somebody else's essay. Right. But in the investing world and in the world of business, unless it's covered by a patent or unless it's covered by a copyright, there are so many ideas that you can pick up from other people. And um, uh, but then it's so, so, so who does one copy in a certain way? And uh, so, you know, there's a statement that was, I don't know if where you were in the, I think it was the first Iraq war and General Norman Schwarzkopf was giving a press conference and the uh, invasion of Iraq had just started. And there were these maps up of Kuwait and the border with Iraq and um, there's some islands there and, you know, various different obstacles. And the, the I think that the objective was Basra and they were like, they could go by the sea, they could go by land, they could go over a river, they could. And so the journalist asked Norman Schwarzkopf, um, so which way is the US military going? Are they going around? Are they going over? How, what route are the US military taking? And Schwarzkopf looks at the journalist and says, we're going over, under, around, on top, on the bottom, to the left, to the right, every which way we're going. And I think that he wasn't trying to be cute. I think it was just true. The US military was finding, was using multiple routes to get in. And um, so I, I think that when it comes to cloning great investors, I think that 
there's there's no reason to stop at one. We have mm. to examine all of them. And you know, you come up to me and you say, "Hey, guy, there's there's somebody who thinks about the world in a really interesting way." I'll take a look at their stuff as well. You know, so but we, you know, it's like I'm using my arms. You want to grab, grab that stuff, grab the information, download the 13 apps, and um, uh, so I, I think that so. The world is full of information, and the world is full of. So we need we need a principle by which to decide what to look at and how to prioritize. And I think that the information that somebody else decided to put something into their portfolio is interesting in and of itself. So, mm -hmm. you know, I don't know what kind of signal information it has. I understand that at one point. Bill Miller had all of his money in one stock or something, which seems a little insane to me, but that's what he was doing. That's the leg mason guy? Um, Bill Miller, he's the leg mason. Uh, oh, my leg mason, yeah. Okay. So, so, you know, I think that's interesting information. So it's not just who do you clone? It's like, who is the personality behind this portfolio? Why is the, given everything I know about this individual, why is he or she doing this? Why did he or she decide to buy this? And, you know, a picture starts emerging of what's going on. So the work of cloning is not just like, do I find some great investor and look at their list of companies and then figure out if one of them's right for me? It's, you know, I, I, it's weird because if I, if I watch somebody playing chess, I can't go and pick up their game and play the same game. But in a certain way, in investing, you can. So, but it's like, you know, I can have the same game. I could have the same pieces on the chessboard because I could buy the same portfolio as Warren Buffett. Well, in the publicly traded stocks, I could buy the same portfolio if I wanted to. So, but that's not enough. It's, it's this idea of saying, what's the personality of Warren Buffett? How's he playing at his chessboard? What's the personality of Jeff? Uh, Uben, I think his name is a value at capital. Why is he playing the moves that he's playing? And I think that as you do that, you pick up, you, you know, a, um, I, I had somebody in my office yesterday who's got money from the uh, um, Norwegian Central Bank, mm -hmm. the State Investment Fund of Norway. And, uh, you know, I want to look at her portfolio. I want to see, she said she owns 20 great compounders in China. I don't know which they are, but I want to look at her portfolio. Having gotten to know her, I'd love to see what she owns and why she owns it. So I don't know if that, that's kind of a non-answer to your question in terms of what to plan. But, but my word to you is, and to the, anybody who listens to this video is, if, if, you're, if they've come to your attention, you know, figure them out, go, go intensive on them, find out who they are, find out what their biases are, find out why they invest the way they invest, where does their money come from, what is their time horizon, what kind of trades have they done in the past, how have they acted with the portfolio, what life situation are they going through, and then get a sense of whether it's like, my God, I really want to pay attention to this guy. Mm -hmm. I mean, a guy that I came across today, I mean, I came across, I've, I've met him once and, um, uh, but it, he came up in conversation yesterday is this guy, Byron Trott, who's Warren Buffett's investment banker. And I just realized he doesn't, he doesn't, he doesn't run a portfolio, but he's a super interesting guy. And uh, I want to clone him, you know, and, and by the way, cloning that him does not just mean try and clone his portfolio moves, like try and clone his life. Mm -hmm. How does he run a meeting? Who does he, who did, how does he decide who to pick up the phone to? when he gets into the office in the morning, how does he make hiring decisions? How does he choose which restaurant he goes to at night? And what, you know, what, what social engagements does he accept? Does he not accept what? All of those things are ways of kind of like cloning the best in the person to try and get the best in ourselves. Okay. All right. So I know you have a couple of kids. I got two little ones and I'm, I'm trying to teach them as much as I can. What, what advice do you give your children about investing? You know, I, um, I was, uh, I opened up a Charles Schwab brokerage account for my children uh, two or three years ago and bought them some shares or they bought some shares for themselves. 
I was really blown away by what an impact that had on them. It had a huge okay. impact. And so then they came to me and they said, oh, great, we've made a 10% return. So can I take uh, the, uh, you know, the $200 on the $2,000 I put in there and can I go and spend it? And I was like, no. <laughs> so my son says, well, when can I? Can I do it when it reaches 5,000? I was like, no. He says, so when? I said, never. <laughs> and, and he said, that's too long. I said, okay, fine, when it hits 50 million. When the account's got 50 million in it, otherwise you're just gonna keep putting money in there and you're just gonna keep investing. And that's, that's right. how compounding works, right? <laughs> exactly. And so, um, so, you know, I, I was, just, I didn't realize what an impact that would have. I also was amazed at the impact that taking them to the Berkshire Hathaway meeting had. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, they were really young. I mean, they were like not more than 10 years old, any one of them. And they, they took a lot away from that meeting. I was really surprised. They really, okay. Yeah, so I think that, so two lessons are, you know, there's nothing like the experience of owning something. There's nothing like the experience of doing it yourself there's nothing like the experience of showing up. So, you know, it's showing up in a community of value investors like the Berkshire meeting, I think is a, is a huge deal. Really, right. really worth doing. All right. Well, I appreciate your time. Just want to ask you one, one last question. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I got your book. Yeah. I, I, I love reading about value investing. What are some of the books you're reading right now? Um, you know, the book that I was reading this morning, is uh, a book by Nicole Schwab. Mm -hmm. So uh, let me just look it up. It's uh, it's called The Heart of the Labyrinth. And I don't know how it got across my desk, but she's somebody who lives in Geneva. And I started off reading it and thinking that I didn't like it. And then actually she's been giving me some great insights. This is all about living a more mindful life and a life okay. where you're more aware, where you kind of like get in touch with yourself. But um, the other book that I'm reading right now that's on my Kindle um, is called The Content Trap. And that's more of a business book. Uh, so, so that's kind of a, that's a really worthwhile book to read. Bara, Bara Anand. Um, and then I actually picked up the Steve Schwartzman book. Mm -hmm. And I, I picked it up thinking I'd read about some egotistical guy. It's actually really good. I mean, yeah. I can't, I lost the book, so I haven't read it for a few days now. But uh, uh, and then I, you know, I'll give you, I'll give you two more. So uh, one is um, "Too Small to Fail" by James Briding. Yeah, I've heard of that one. He writes about uh, countries, small countries. So the idea is some of the most successful companies in these small countries, like uh, Israel, Denmark, Singapore. And they, they seem to do way better than big countries in all sorts of ways. And why is that? And what can the big countries learn from them? Mm -hmm. that's, uh, that's one that I haven't yet read, but I've read some. So he just gave me his copy. And, um, uh, and then uh, my friend Rolf Debelli just published a book called, uh, 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 I've got to get the right title. Uh, hang on. Uh, yeah, uh, wait, wait a second, I wanna get the right title. Uh, shoot, it's by Rolf de Belli. It's, it's, it's called Stop Reading the News, something like that. Hold on a second. What was his name again? Oh, come on, man. I'm, I'm searching for it on the internet here and, uh, uh, and it's like, hold on a second. I'm gonna get you the exact name can't believe yeah so the title of the book is stop reading the news <laughs> I rolled the title that's for sure it's kind of fun yeah so that's a little bit of what I'm reading now but you know people say what to read and and, and my answer is read everything so when I think that what's really important is when Warren Buffett says start at the age yeah what he's really saying is, I don't want to answer the question, figure it out for yourself. And I think that, or, or maybe one step beyond that is he's saying, you know, read everything. Read everything in front of you and then make intelligent choices. So 
if you like what you're reading, trust yourself. Trust, so, so it's certainly valuable information to find out what Guy Spear is reading right now. But just because I'm reading and enjoying something doesn't mean it's the right thing for you. It doesn't really mean it's the right thing for somebody else. So to use that piece of information, but use the meta information. Oh, that's interesting. Guy Spear liked it. So as you read, it's like, my God, I'm loving this book. I really get why Guy Spear liked it. Or this is what Guy Spear spent his time reading. That's ridiculous. You know, I'll give this another... 10 pages and then if something doesn't grab me, I'm, I'm dropping out of this man, you know? Yeah. Every, every book is like a conversation with the author. And so, you know, we walk into a room with 300 people, we cannot have a conversation with everyone, we have to pick. And it is fine to start talking to somebody and then to go, oh, actually there's somebody more interesting, I'm gonna go and talk to them. Or I've had enough of this conversation Maybe I'll dip back into it when if I have more time, but there's kind of something going on over there that I really want to be a part of. That's all absolutely fine. And, you know, we're each on an individual journey. We're each on a different path. So I can, just because I like a book doesn't mean that you should like it. Or just because I got something out of a book doesn't mean that you'll get something out of it. Maybe you will really learn the lessons that I need to learn. Mm -hmm. Or maybe you're not ready for the lessons. Or maybe, maybe that book is not going to, communicate the lessons to you because you're a different person. And so the, 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 and, and my answer is, uh, you know, again, it's this kind of thing. It's like grab, I, I love buying books. I buy books, uh, put them on shelves all over the place. I move them around uh, to have the ones that I'm most interested in reading. And my library is, uh, you know, there's an article of Ink Magazine about it. It's called having an anti-library. An anti-library is like, when you've read a book, you give it away. Mm -hmm. uh, and so all the books in your library are books you haven't read. Because, and especially these days, if, if there's a book that, I've, that, that I gave away that I want to get back again, I, I can go get it in a few days and get yeah. the book back. So you know, the whole library is available right there. In fact, you can't see it because it's the other side of my desk. But when I'm done with the book, I put it onto a shelf next to my desk and then I send it out. To I send them out to people randomly. So if you give Is that me the right picture you put on Instagram? What's that? Is that the picture, the, the bookshelf yeah, on Instagram? Maybe, well, maybe it was just shelves, but give me your address. I'll, I'm not sure if I have it. I'll send you a book after this call. Okay. What's, it, your, what's your address? It's uh, 31 in Sewell yeah. and the zip is 08080. What a great zip code. Yeah, <laughs> it's pretty easy to remember. <laughs> That's it. That's a palindromic uh, zip code. I'll, yep. I'll send you. I'll, I'll pick a couple of books off the shelf uh, from one of the ones that I've read, and uh, then you'll get one. I appreciate that. Thank you. And yeah. let, let me know next time you're in Philly. I'll take you to the uh, the, the best really cheesesteak place in the city. Yeah, I'm not. I, I don't really like cheesesteak, but I'll have the steak without the cheese. How's that? Uh, this sounds good. You got a deal. Yeah. All right, guy. Well, enjoy, and I, I hope this was helpful. It's a real pleasure to meet you. Oh, this was excellent. I really appreciate it. Thank you so um, much for your time. Tell Chantel, I said thank you very much as well. Yeah. I'm realizing that I really like your shirt. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah. I, the, I do it in blue, but it's okay. The red is also fine. I got a blue one too, but this is, uh, when, I, when I'm wearing this, that means all my other dress shirts are, uh, it, it's time to go to the cleaners. This is it's the bottom of the shelf. <laughs> thank you. Okay. Have a good rest of the day, Tom. All right, you too, guy. Take care. Thank you, yeah. Thanks. Bye.